Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rena Agarwal, and I am the Chief Operating Officer at the Center for Active Design. For those of you who are new to our organization, we are a global not-for-profit organization working at the intersection of health and the built environment. Our vision is to ensure that all buildings in all neighborhoods have the opportunity to support health, regardless of their geography, age, or budget. But most of you who have joined us today know us as the operator of FitWell, the leading certification system committed to building health for all. Needless to say, it's been quite an unusual and crazy year for everyone as we've grappled with the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet there's also so much to celebrate, and I'm happy that we can convene virtually to take a moment and recognize the extraordinary achievements of our Fitwell family, who really have responded to these challenges with extraordinary agility. While I know that this virtual setting may not be the ideal party environment, we hope that the precautions that we're all taking will now position us to celebrate together and in person next year. So with that, I'd like to give a brief overview of today's 90 minute Best in Building Health event. So our virtual celebration will be divided into three sections. During part one, we'll reflect on our collective resiliency of the past year, celebrate some of our special recognition of awards and hear from some remarkable guest speakers. We'll also recognize many of the firms who've made impressive strides in impacting health into 2020. During part two, we'll report out on Fitwell's growth over the last four years and continue to highlight our best in building health winners. For part three, we'll look ahead to the future and welcome representatives from our all time leading firms to reflect on how Fitwell is shaping their real estate portfolios and building momentum for a healthier future. So just a couple of housekeeping notes before I pass it on to Joanna. So first, I encourage all of you to tweet about this event connect with each other and have lively conversations about the topics discussed using the hashtag best in building health. Second, if you have questions at any point, please submit them during the Q&A. If our team can't respond to all questions during the session, we'll be sure to follow up with the responses after the event. And finally, periodically through this event, our team will use the chat to share links and resources and articles. If you miss something, don't worry, we will package these into a virtual gift bag to share it after the event. So keep an eye on your inboxes next week. And with that, I'm happy to pass the conversation over to Joanna Frank, continues to be my favorite Brit, and also the CEO and Center for Active, President and CEO of the Center for Active Design. Thanks so much, Rena. Thank you. Yeah, I am British in case people are trying to guess my accent, uh, although I think the British don't really accept me anymore, but that's an entirely other discussion. Um, so thank you. Yeah, it certainly has been quite a year. I think that's an understatement. Um, today, we would really like to take the opportunity to reflect on the resilience that we've seen from Fitwell users and celebrate all of your successes. So thank you so much for joining us. And of course, thank you to everybody who's been using Fitwell since its inception four years ago. Um, I'm sure like this is true for you as it is for us that all of our well laid plans from last year for 2020, um, just we had to scrap them just like everybody else, right? We all had to really adjust to the pandemic um, and what that meant for whatever aspect of business that we're in. Our team was certainly immediately inundated with questions and phone calls from all of you and from the industry at large, really asking like, how do we take the public health research? How do we navigate through uh, this COVID pandemic and really create spaces and buildings and environments that are optimized for people that we serve, whether they're our employees, whether they're stakeholders of any kind, tenants, et cetera. Uh, public health was really thrust into the limelight um, and we were all called upon to meet the moment. And that really is gonna be the theme of today that all of you have met the moment. Um, we've seen incredible innovation and resilience uh, amongst the real estate community. So congratulations to everybody. Again, just gonna keep saying congratulations. We have so much to celebrate. Um, so what really impressed me about last spring, you know, yeah, everything was changing, everything was really changing quickly, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and everybody was willing to share what they were learning across the industry, across public health, uh, across our academic advisors, um, that collaboration and that willingness to share in the development of the viral response module really made it possible for us to do this in this incredibly expedited time frame. Uh, so it really wouldn't have been possible without all of that uh, input from everybody and everybody's willingness to really uh, share what they had learned and, and put this into something that the entire industry could use. Um, to do this, to, to kind of uh, facilitate this sharing, we convened two influential advisory groups, 
One of them were, was comprised of academics who covered all aspects of health. So infectious disease, of course, but also mental health, psychology, behavioral sciences, so that we could really understand how to best mitigate the transmission of viral uh, infectious disease, which of course is what COVID-19 is. Um, the other group was really looking at leading uh, real estate industry experts who really came to us and let us know what they needed from a product from this viral response module in order that they could uh, enact this at scale across their portfolios and really do this quickly, really quickly to respond to the demand that they were feeling and that they were seeing from their tenants, from their users, from their investors. Um, we all did a remarkable job. I must shout out to the CFAD team. They did an incredible job of bringing together the evidence base, bringing together the advisors and translating that into the viral response module. We learned so much from both of the groups. Um, we really had to challenge ourselves and think outside the box. As I think probably everybody here who's joining us today because you're Fitwell users, you know that our standard Fitwell scorecard impacts holistic health outcomes. Um, and there's no re prerequisites in the standard Fitwell um, because it's based on public health science and all projects can be optimized uh, to enhance the health of their occupants. And for holistic health outcomes, there is no one size fits all solution. Um, this approach was developed initially by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, who obviously were part of the initial creation and development of the Fitwell standard along with the General Service Administration. Um, this approach was based on a rigorous review and the translation of thousands of peer reviewed research studies from around the world. Um, and this is kind of the essence of Fitwell. It allows it to be used at scale. It allows it to be used across uh, really varied asset classes, new uh, buildings, existing buildings, et cetera. Um, and it's a sof the sophisticated weighting that's behind Fitwell um, that is from that rigorous analysis of the public health research means that every strategy has a different amount of points associated with it. And you can really set priorities based on that weighted system. So this is all the essence of what the Fitwell standard is. It's really based on that rigorous review of the health and the research. Um, so when we came to looking at the COVID, at the pandemic, um, we really had to kind of look at what is the science? What does the science tell us about how you respond to a contagious respiratory disease, which of course is not holistic health. It's a very specific part of health, um, which is why the actual solution is different from that holistic approach for the overall standard. Um, so we worked with our academic advisors to develop a multifaceted approach and establish implementation rigor using the best available science. For the first time, we actually have set minimum requirements uh, in the viral response module because in order to effectively address the viral, um, the viral threat that the pandemic um, was, was facing us, um, you really need to look at the specific evidence base around how do you mitigate infectious respiratory disease specifically. Um, therefore, we set minimum requirements, um, which include looking at air quality, looking at cleaning protocols, but also really looking at mental health as well. And how do we support trust as well through the design and operation of our buildings? Meanwhile, our industry advisors were expressed to us that they really needed us to focus on looking at policies so that they could be implemented at scale across portfolios. And for us to create the turnkey policies for you all to use as templates because of the rapid nature that was needed as far as the rollout of the viral response uh, module. So we created those uh, turnkey policies, which is also something that we haven't done before. Um, the viral response module was launched in September of 2020, and we have already, you have already, <laughs> identified more than 900 assets uh, that are slated to be impacted by the viral response module. So an amazing achievement and really incredibly rapid uptick. Um, and we just see this daily. We see more and more companies using this on a daily basis. So it's really uh, obviously testament to all of you for, for really weighing in on how to create something that would respond to the market. Um, we couldn't have developed the viral response module without you in such short order and, and to make it so responsive. So thank you again for all of your generosity in giving your time, giving your expertise, um, and really working with us in partnership to create the viral response module. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Rena, who's actually gonna uh, do some of the first awards of the day. 
Yeah, well, thanks, Joanna. So I have the distinct pleasure of kicking off the first set of awards. So each year at Best in Building Health, we select up to two winners to receive special recognition for their exceptional leadership in the field. This year, we granted two awards, and there really was no question in our minds that we wanted to celebrate our academic advisory group by giving them this award. This passionate group of scientists and medical professionals contributed their expertise to assess the emerging science around COVID and other contagious diseases. They worked to coalesce the detailed evidence that underpins the FitWell viral response module. It was honestly quite moving to see this group of individuals passionately impact communities in need by day and spend any remaining time with us to ensure that the viral response module was built on the best data and science available. And of course, we would be remiss if we didn't express our extreme gratitude to our partners at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for helping to facilitate our academic advisory meetings in the midst of what was a very busy time. So as you can see from the slide, we were able to convene an impressive task force with researchers who are the very best in their respective fields. So with that, I have the pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Ban Ku to say a few words on behalf of our academic advisory group. Ban's resume is deeply impressive. He's an emergency room physician. He directs the health and design lab at Thomas Jefferson University. And he recently published a must read book on design thinking. And he also hosts a podcast on this very topic. I am proud to say he is also the newest board member for the Center for Actor Design. I have literally no idea how he does it all, but I'm still thrilled that he is here to offer a few remarks today. Uh, hi, everyone. On behalf of the Academic Advisory Group, I want to thank the Center for uh, Active Design. So uh, we know that we can create healthy buildings and unhealthy ones. But during this pandemic, we experienced the life and death consequences for those design decisions. About a year ago today, I was afraid of getting infected with the coronavirus because I was working in the emergency room. The science behind uh, transmission was lacking. Could coronavirus end up living on my skin or my hospital scrubs and end up infecting my family? Uh, out of fear, out of infecting my wife and two kids, I didn't hug them and slept in a different part of our house for the first month of the first wave. Uh, some nights I ended up even sleeping in a hotel room and I had to work a string of shifts in the hospital. But as we got more data, it became clear that the virus spreads uh, through aerosols and not through uh, contact. Fortunately, at my hospital, we had a steady supply of PPE. I never ended up uh, getting COVID. Um, and eventually the anxiety of entering into an exam room with a patient who was coughing violently from uh, COVID dissipated uh, because we knew how to protect ourselves from being infected when doing dangerous aerosolizing procedures, uh, such as intubating a patient in respiratory failure from COVID pneumonia. But I had other questions. How could I protect myself from being infected outside of the patient room? Uh, could I actually get infected by drinking a cup of coffee during my shift in the hospital? Uh, in the beginning, we weren't allowed to drink or eat in clinical areas, uh, but we could drink and eat in staff break rooms. But these were small, enclosed, six by six windowless areas. It was probably not the safest thing to do to eat without a mask with other frontline healthcare staff. Um, eventually, I decided that the safest thing to do was to drink coffee at my workstation, which was in the center of the emergency room, because I knew that the nurses and doctors next to me were wearing N95 respirators. I wish um, hospitals were better designed. I wish we had simple things like more windows because often it feels like I'm trapped in a hermetically sealed box. Um, we can increase air exchanges per hour by simple things like opening a window. Um, no hospital had enough negative pressure isolation rooms to treat patients with COVID. So we ended up interviewing, examining patients in enclosed rooms that had little air exchange. The human toil of the pandemic has been devastating. 
over a half a million Americans have died. But what about the mental health impact from COVID? Americans, especially those in black and brown communities have suffered disproportionately. They have had higher deaths, uh, higher rates of hospitalizations. Many of my sickest patients uh, come from the sickest areas from Philadelphia. Uh, decades of disinvestment in these communities have resulted in these health inequities. Uh, but we do have the evidence to design healthier communities through the built environment. We just need to invest in these communities. I'm optimistic that we can and we will get through this current crisis, but will we be prepared for the next one? We have this opportunity to both reimagine and redesign our built environment and I hope we can implement the science of healthy buildings into our hospitals, our workplaces, our homes, and our communities. I'm so grateful for the Center for Active Design and for all the organizations and people here today uh, because we're, we're doing that and we can design a better future for us all. Thank you. Thank you, Vaughn, again, for joining us today, taking time out of your schedule and providing that real critical historical perspective from um, you know, medical professionals in the scientific community. Again, congratulations. And um, you know, we all needed your support and your, your efforts and your work over the last year. And, and thank you so much for rising to the occasion. And now, so before announcing our special second recognition award, Joanna and I would like to take a moment to recognize a few of the companies that stepped up with some remarkable achievements during the past year. We'll pull up some slides here and share a few of the award winners who received notable distinctions for their impact on health in 2020. So first on our list is Noresco. Noresco is the consultant who supported the greatest number of certifications in 2020. Noresco has worked with a number of different companies to help them successfully move projects through the Fitwell certification process using both FitWell scorecards and the viral response module. Noresco was being recognized for an additional award this year, achieving the greatest impact in terms of square footage certified through their work with RxR Realty. Next, and among building owners, Beacon Capital is one of the two companies tied for completing the greatest number of certifications. Beacon became a FitWell champion in 2020 and immediately began making strides to advance occupant health. As you can see, they're also receiving multiple awards this year. Taken collectively, Beacon certified buildings have impacted the most people in 2020. Their AMA Plaza project in Chicago also received the highest score among all of the projects using the multi-tenant whole building V2.1 scorecards. So next we wanna recognize Hudson Pacific Properties. Hudson Pacific graciously hosted last year's Best in Building Health event at the iconic Ferry Building in San Francisco. They became a football champion in 2020, and this year, Hudson Pacific is tied for the distinction of achieving the most certifications amongst building owners. Hudson Pacific is also receiving a second award for their Bentel Center project in Vancouver, Canada, which happens to be 2020's highest scoring commercial site project. And finally, I am pleased to recognize Anthem as the tenant with the greatest number of certifications. By the end of 2020, Anthem boasted more than 3.5 million square feet of Fitwell certified office space across the country, accounting for one third of their real estate portfolio. Anthem was an early supporter of Fitwell and remains a key advisory partner who is actively promoting healthy and productive workspaces. So super congratulations to Noresco, Beacon, Hudson Pacific and Anthem and thank you for your impactful work. Yeah, absolutely. Congratulations all of you and thank you, Rena. Um, so I'm going to pivot towards registrations. Um, uh, this year, Jones Lang LaSalle is the consultant with the greatest number of registrations. JLL has been a Fitwell champion since 2019. And in addition to their prolific consulting efforts to guide clients through the Fitwell registration and certification, they're also actively registering and certifying their own projects within their own portfolio. And you'll hear more about uh, an award that LaSalle has achieved amongst the highest scoring project category. Next up is Quadrail. A Quadrail property group stands out this year as the owner with the greatest number of registrations. This marks a continuation of their impressive leadership. 
role. Um, last year, you may remember that they actually uh, were awarded the Special Recognition Award, um, and they're continuing this pioneering work uh, as they continue uh, with the successes with Fitwell. Uh, last year, we mentioned that we had worked with Quadrail in the Office Guide for Building Health. I mean, we will share um, a link to that uh, publication as well for everybody. Uh, so congratulations to Quadrail, thank you. And lastly, in this group, uh, Wells Fargo. So our next slide is one from Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo are the tenant with the greatest number of registrations in 2020. Wells Fargo is applying Fitwell to systematically benchmark projects across their expansive and diverse portfolio, demonstrating how Fitwell can be used to engage stakeholders, uh, including employees and uh, folks coming into their banks as well. And stick around, you're going to hear more from Wells Fargo themselves personally um, at the end in our panel. So, and that's going to be in part three of today's discussion. Absolutely. So now we'll shift the awards related to scale of impact. Our first winner in this category is a collaboration between Lincoln Property Company and Ampigen Solutions, who have made impressive strides on certifying projects with Fitwell's commercial site scorecard. Lincoln and Ampigen are awardees in two impact categories for most people impacted and highest acreage certified among site scorecard users. Next, Lionstone has tied as a winner in this impact category sharing the achievement for the highest acreage certified among site scorecards for their work in Houston, Texas. I'm also pleased to report that Lionstone officially became a Fitwell champion in the fall of 2020 and has certified multiple projects throughout Texas. Finally, we mentioned a collaboration between RxR and Noresco earlier, but it's certainly worth coming back to, to make sure that RxR gets some well-deserved recognition for having the greatest impact on building health with the highest square footage certified amongst building scorecards. RxR received their first Fitwell certification in early 2020 and is truly setting pace by continuing to register and certify their portfolio at scale through an effective partnership with Noresco. Great, and I'd like to close out this batch of recognition by circling back to our viral response module, where we've seen some standout implementation leaders in the last quarter of 2020. Remembering it was only, it was only launched in September, so amazing achievement, everybody. Um, so first off, uh, the Meridian Group with Palladino and Company. I'm pleased to recognize uh, both of these companies for achieving the highest score in the viral response module. And just to give everyone an idea of just how high and just how impressive their achievement was, they scored 99%, um, which is out of 100, because yes, I am British and we only go up to 100. Um, so obviously that is setting the bar really high for everybody. Um, we haven't obviously had a perfect score yet, but still this is unbelievable achievement. Um, so as early adopters of the viral response module, it's really a remarkable achievement. Um, and they really couldn't have set the bar much higher. So congratulations to the Meridian Group and Palladino and Company. Uh, the Meridian Group is now rapidly rolling out the certified module across its portfolio. In fact, we received word from the team last night that 20 of their assets were approved just yesterday. So congratulations, really incredible. And now I'm gonna change pace a little bit um, to, to talk about the last award winner um, because it is Bentle Green Oak. Um, I'm very happy to share our second special recognition award of the day, which is, as I say, going to Bentle Green Oak, who we call BGO. As you can see, there's no shortage of accolades for BGO this year. In fact, this is a record number of uh, awards given out in any, any year. As um, just a couple of months ago, after the viral response module was received, they certified their portfolio and achieved asset level improvements for seven, 17 projects at, uh, in nine cities. Uh, they have two of the highest scoring projects for 2020 as well, with 150 King Street West in Toronto and for Capitol Hill in Seattle. BGO is also being recognized for leadership in a collaborative effort to explore industry-wide investor sentiment about health and wellness trends. Those of you joining today will be lucky to get a little sneak peek into some of the findings from this report, which will be released publicly next week. So at this time, I'm thrilled to introduce Anna Murray to share a few words about BGO's leadership in meeting the moment to guide the healthy, healthy building movement forward. Anna has spent much of her, her career advancing corporate strategy around the globe at mul many major multinationals and currently heads up BGO's global ESG platform. 
her bio has been shared with you in the chat function. So I don't need to go through all of that. So I'm so pleased uh, to be able to introduce Anna and pass the mic over to her now. Thanks, Joanna, and thanks to the CFED team. Also, thank you very much, Dr. Koo, for your extremely thoughtful comments uh, earlier uh, on, on uh, this event today. And a huge congratulations to all of my peers on these wonderful awards today. Uh, by way of background, my name is Anna Murray, and I'm the global head of ESG at Bentall Green Oak. Uh, we are a global real estate investment management advisor with approximately 50 billion worth of assets under management globally. So today we wanted to talk about how our world is increasingly being challenged by climate change, social inequities, and the global pandemic. You know, now more than ever, 2020 brought the importance of ESG to the forefront. And for many of us on the call today, Strong ESG performance is critical to investor performance and in establishing our respective portfolios of the future. And we're living in a time of rapidly increasing regulatory and disclosure requirements. The news that came out today around carbon tax in Canada, uh, we've got increasing investor and tenant related demand and implications of a transition to a low carbon economy has never been more relevant. Responsible real estate investors seem to have awakened to the notion that buildings that we manage for our clients are part of the critical infrastructure that cities rely on for the resilience and health and well being of their citizens. So, where excellence in environmental performance has rightly become a, a more common pursuit for our industry. Our fiduciary responsibilities are increasingly taking us to this new territory that requires attention to the multitude of social factors that impact asset value. In our collective experience with this first modern pandemic of our lifetime is teaching us how closely tied investor performance can be to operational excellence, tenant engagement and community relationships, specifically that of health and wellness in the built environment. So as Joanna mentioned, we have been pleased to explore these timely themes in the first ever report for the global commercial real estate industry alongside our partners at the United Nations Environment Program Finance Initiatives and of course the Center for Active Design. So our report titled A New Investor Consensus, The Rising Demand of Healthy Buildings is set to launch next week. This report highlights how investors who may have only thought of well being and passing within their approach to ESG strategies are now more aware of the link between building design and function and personal and societal health and wellness. So, no doubt, this has given rise to a more concerted focus on the S or social component of ESG which has traditionally lagged behind the more well-defined environmental and governance pillars. So this new report finds that the vast majority of those who participated in the survey expect demand for healthy buildings to grow in the next three years. So this is an incredibly compelling sign and very exciting sign in terms of the direction that the real estate industry is heading. So what? So the pandemic, has highlighted for all of us the importance of health and real estate and the perils of being unprepared for the future. So both the risks and the opportunities seem to provide us with compelling reasons to both develop and implement solutions that uplift our industry. So the steps that we take now to mitigate future risks will have clear implications for the safety and well-being of our occupants and the spaces that they rely on for their prosperity. So we're really excited to share the findings with you next week and we sincerely appreciate the participation of our industry peers in the development of this report. Many of you are on the call today, so thank you. Uh, thank you to CFAD for having us here today and congratulations again to all. And we look forward to continuing to work with all of you to advance the, the health and wellness agenda in the built environment. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anna. And yeah, we're really uh, proud to have worked with you and with the UN to create the investor report and look forward to sharing 
all of the findings with folks uh, next week. So lots more to come on that front. So thank you again. And congratulations on all of your many awards. Wonderful. Um, so now this takes us into part two. And Suzanne, who is running the show today, is going to be very proud of us for being on time. Um, so the second part of today's agenda, um, we are really looking at celebrating success and Fitwell's growth over the last uh, four years. Uh, as I mentioned, we have just turned four. Um, it's actually, maybe we could make today our official birthday. We were born some, Fitwell was born sometime in March uh, of 2017. So let's just say today is our official birthday, like the Queen, you can have two. Um, so I'm going to step aside uh, for the next section. I'll be back for the last section where we're obviously hosting the panel. Um, and now I would like to introduce Zach Flora, who is the Director of Market Growth here at the Center for Active Design. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Zach and Rena for the next section. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. And thanks to everyone who joined today's celebration. It's great to see that there are so many attendees in the audience right now. Uh, the past four years have been quite a journey for us. I know for many, 2020 alone has felt like a decade and not just a year. <laughs> um, but I'd like to take a few minutes to just provide a high level overview of Fitwell's growth and evolution over the last four years. As we look at Fitwell's growth, um, I'd like to focus in on our registration numbers specifically. Uh, registration numbers are important to us because they're a predictive indicator that tell us what's coming down the pipeline. Uh, since a majority of registered projects will ultimately submit for certification. As you can see from this trend line, Fitwell saw a steady growth during its first few years, followed by a very significant uptick in 2020. In fact, we saw over 190% growth in registrations between 2019 and 2020. Uh, and if we look more closely at just quarter four, that year over year quarterly growth topped 600%. Continuing to look at registrations, we also see a shift in where Fitwell is making an impact. As the certification uh, was initially developed in the US by the Centers for Disease Control and the General Services Administration, it may come as no surprise that the US and Canada are home to the most Fitwell registrations to date. Uh, the second column here is, is what really interests me though. Uh, this is where we are learning more about where Fitwell is gaining ground. Uh, for example, this year we, we are recognizing a couple of winners from Brazil and based off registration numbers, it looks like Fitwell can expect more projects in the years to come. Uh, Brazil is currently experiencing the fastest growth of any country in Fitwell, uh, Fitwell certifications. Fitwell is designed to be scalable for companies and flexible in its application um, as it strives to build health for all. And, and looking at some of these countries on this list and some of these registration numbers, um, we're, we feel confident that Fitwell's uh, global impact will continue. Since North America remains the dominant global region, uh, let's dive in a bit further to those findings. Um, I'm sure it's no surprise that the cities shown here represent the dominant markets for Fitwell in North America, uh, but I also wanted to share with you where Fitwell's impact is growing. Uh, so during our end of year data analysis of US registrations, we saw that the South is definitely on an upswing as a region, um, actually overtaking the Northeast as our second most prominent region. Um, the South saw a 30% growth in Fitwell registrations during the last year alone. And looking at North America more broadly, uh, Fitwell now has a presence in 49 US states, uh, three out of 32 Mexican states, and eight out of 13 Canadian provinces. And as most of you who have joined us are aware, Fitwell's strength stems from its partnerships. Um, over the past four years, the growth of the certification system and creation of new scorecards has been driven by our Fitwell users. Uh, so from our legacy advisory, from our leadership advisory board uh, to our Fitwell champion companies and our Fitwell ambassadors, uh, we are currently working with the best of the best. Um, I, I strongly believe this, you know, each day I get to work with many of our champion companies and our ambassadors as they explore Fitwell for their partnerships and their programs. Um, with that, I'd like to take a brief moment to just acknowledge our stellar Fitwell champions, both uh, current champions and legacy companies, uh, many of whom are receiving awards today. I'd also like to share just this quick snapshot of the growth of our ambassador program over the past few years. Uh, individual ambassadors come from a variety of professions, including architects and engineers, uh, sustainability consultants, urban designers, property and facility managers, and many more. Uh, the project teams rely on them to help submit high quality Fitwell projects and pass the rigor of the standard and achieve Fitwell certification. Uh, 
Uh, I'm thrilled to report today that we boast more than 2,500 FitWell ambassadors from 50 plus countries worldwide. With that, I'm pleased to share the latest snapshot of FitWell by the numbers. In just four short years, uh, FitWell has impacted well over a million people and more than half a billion square feet of real estate. Uh, to sum up here, FitWell is on its way towards its commitment to building health for all and cultivating a global real estate industry that prioritizes human health as a cornerstone of the investment and planning uh, and the design and operations that underpin every project. As our global reach continues to grow, uh, we're thrilled to have each of you bring your own expertise to the table uh, and truly help us continue to optimize health across the globe. Rena, back to you. Awesome. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, Zach. Um, it's amazing to see how our growth has happened over the last four years as we've come upon our fourth birthday and really get a snapshot of how much has happened in such a short time. So I'd now like to turn around to a few more awards announcements. As you all know, FitWell strives to be accessible with scorecards that offer clear and transparent documentation requirements and a certification interface on the FitWell portal designed to help all users succeed in applying FitWell across their real estate portfolios. Yet for those of you who are experienced FitWell users, I'm sure that I don't need to tell you just how rigorous our certification can be with a double blind review process that holds our users to the very, very highest standard. With this level of rigor in mind, Zach and I are thrilled to announce our winners who have the highest scoring projects over the past year under their respective scorecards. So to begin with our commercial interior space winners, I'm pleased to share some amazing international highlights. First, I'd like to recognize M. Mosier for their V2.0 Fitwell Certified Hong Kong office, which serves as a lab for healthy and sustainable workplace design and embodies their people-centric approach. Next, and under the V2.0 built certification, AMP is being recognized for their outstanding Melbourne, Australia project known as AMP 1MQ. This commercial interior project was led by a remarkable team and demonstrates the influential role tenants can play in maximizing the health of their buildings. And finally, for the V2.1 design certification, I'm excited to highlight CBRE's Shanghai office which upon its completion will provide an exceptional health promoting environment for building occupants. Big congratulations to our three commercial interior winners. Rena, it's fantastic to see so many international projects this year. Um, and this international theme holds true for the highest scoring projects in our single tenant category. Uh, first up, Sansiri Public Company Limited and Atelier 10 are being recognized for their spectacular Siri campus in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, this project stands out as our highest scoring built certified single tenant project in 2020. Uh, shifting over to South America, iFood and CTE are recognized for receiving the highest scoring single tenant design certification with the impressive iFood Care in Sao Paulo, Brazil. iFood is streamlining food, stream, streamlining food supply chains while promoting health. These companies and firms are certainly setting the bar high for single tenant scorecard users. Absolutely. So turning toward our multi-tenant base building projects, Stantec has received the highest V2.0 score for Manulife Place in Alberta, Canada. This major redevelopment project is slated to transform the downtown core of Edmonton, incorporating streetscape enhancements and a rooftop terrace. Under our V2.1 scorecard, I am very pleased to recognize PGM and Verdani Partners for Regents Plaza in Atlanta, Georgia. This project achieved a highly impressive three-star rating receiving credit for all but eight strategies in the multi-tenant base building scorecard. Next, and across V2.1 base building design certifications, the American Physical Therapy Association came out on top with the new APTA Centennial Center in Alexandria, Virginia. We were thrilled to see the ribbon cutting for this amazing project happen in January. So congratulations to these best in building health winners. I had the privilege of working with the APTA team um, so kudos to their award as well. Uh, moving on to the multi-tenant whole building scorecard, uh, we see a familiar name with Bental Green Oak. Uh, BGO achieved the highest scoring project under the V2.0 scorecard with 150 King Street West in the heart of Toronto's financial district. Uh, public terrace, uh, fitness center, and more than 200 secure bike racks ensure health is a visible priority for this project. Another familiar awardee is Beacon Capital for the AMA Plaza in Chicago, uh, which boasts the highest built project score under the multi-tenant whole building, uh, the 2.1 scorecard. This landmark Mies van der Rohe building on the Chicago River 
is home to more than 1 million square feet of office space and a five-star hotel. And finally, rounding out the Mott and Hull building projects, uh, Brookfield Asset Management and CBRE boasted the highest V2.1 design certification for their One East project in Shanghai, China. Located in the center of the city, this mixed use project connects to the surrounding community with unobstructed river views and direct access to a subway line. So kudos to Brookfield and CBRE. So I'm now excited to introduce the multifamily residential projects that rose to the top in 2020. So such a critical year for all of us as we lived and worked at home. And so I'm excited to share some innovations from these projects. So under our V2.0 multifamily scorecard, LaSalle Investment Management achieved the highest built project score for the Penfields in St. Paul, Minnesota. This two-star rated property offers access to parks, playgrounds, bike share, and more, and is the very first Fitwell certified residential project in the state. Next, the Green Cities Company achieved the highest B2.0 design score with their Bauer project in Boston, Massachusetts. The Green Cities Companies became a Fitwell champion in 2019 and are applying the multifamily scorecard to promote health and maximize access to community amenities. Next, and moving over to the V2.1 scorecards, both of our V2.1 multifamily winners are international projects. In the built category, DLC Europe is our best in building health awardee for Clifford House in Exeter, England. As the in-house consultant for Harrison Street, DLC Europe ensures that these student residences offer a multifaceted approach to advance student well-being through design and operational strategies. In our V2.1 design category, AD7 Realty and FDS are being recognized for this iconic project in Curitiba, Brazil, known as Age 360. This project pays meticulous attention to occupant well-being by placing health at the core of all of its design decisions. Moving over to the retail scorecards, our built project winners are Touchwood and Workman for the Touchwood Shopping Center in Solihull, England. This project has already won awards for its environmental and sustainability practices. And now as a best in building health winner, the shopping center also affirms a holistic commitment to occupant health. Our design award for retail project goes to San Francisco International Airport's Harvey Milk Terminal One Center. Uh, the certification process was led by Gensler, who worked closely with the Fitwell team to apply the retail scorecard to this unique typology. Um, so a big congrats to these winners. So Fitwell also offers two site scorecards that can be used to maximize health across larger scale sites. The community and the commercial site scorecards draw upon a trove of health evidence to provide health supportive outdoor areas and common spaces. This year, our community scorecard winner is Bentel Green Oak, whose Capitol, project, Capitol Hill project in Seattle, Washington, provides design and programming amenities that foster health, holistic health and strong community connections, providing space for farmers markets, community events, and informal gatherings. Our commercial site award goes to Hudson Pacific Properties for Bentel Senator in, Van in Vancouver, Canada. This downtown office and retail complex provides public spaces and extensive amenities to create a vibrant place, supporting the site's diverse workforce and visitors from the surrounding community. Thanks, Rena. So that wraps up our list of highest scoring projects in 2020. Uh, a much deserved round of virtual applause to every company that was recognized in their respective categories. Um, some really great stuff here. Uh, these award winners represent an extraordinary body of collective effort and innovation. And I look forward to seeing, and I think the entire Fitwell team looks forward to seeing their next round of certifications in 2021. Uh, with that, Marie and I will pass the mic back over to Joanna to begin our final portion of the event. Um, we're all excited to hear your trendcast regarding what's next for the healthy building movement, um, followed by an exciting panel uh, with our all time uh, winners. Joanna, back to you. Great, thank you so much, Zach, Rena. Um, really wonderful to see all of those incredibly diverse projects uh, that are being recognized this year um, for their outstanding achievements. So congratulations, everybody. Um, so I'd like to turn to the final part of the agenda today, uh, where we're really looking to the future um, and considering some of the key trends that are coming down the pipeline to shape the future of global healthy building movement. Um, I'm gonna be kind of concentrating on highlighting three areas um, all of it is really using data to give us these insights. So the first is really how data is driving decision making that prioritizes health outcomes. Um, kind of as Anna said at the beginning, 
you know, health has really become a major priority for all aspects of the real estate uh, profession. So kind of talking a little bit more about what we're seeing on the data. Um, the second trend is that we're seeing demand changes within the healthy building stakeholder groups. So we'll kind of just give you some insight on what we're seeing as far as how that demand is shifting. Um, and third, uh, just a couple of those numbers from the uh, investor sentiment report that Anna also mentioned earlier, just a sneak peek about how investor sentiment has really been uh, changed because of the COVID-19 pandemic and really understanding how priorities have really changed uh, as a result of us all really understanding the direct connection between how we invest in our properties and how our buildings and our built environment affects the individuals who are within those buildings and are within the overall communities uh, that they serve. And that that connection between investors and the individuals in building has never been clearer. Um, and that is something that's pretty new for the industry. So we'll kind of look at that also. Um, so first of all, let's start by looking at uh, just a few of the numbers around how data is really driving decision-making. Um, one thing that has become abundantly clear is that as Fitworld grows and more companies apply the certification at scale, we're amassing a really sophisticated body of data that can inform nuanced decision-making. Um, for us, you know, this is a really important development uh, in, the, in the growth of Fitwell. Uh, yes, it's a certification, but it's also an incredibly rich body of data that we can all draw from. Our recent data analysis, uh, we actually did some data analysis that was featured in Perry, uh, which is a publication and we'll be uh, sharing out that publication. Um, what we did when we looked at this analysis is that we uncovered exactly how the Fitwell certification projects are collectively impacting all aspects of human health um, using those seven health impact categories that anyone who uses Fitwell is so familiar with that were originally uh, identified by the CDC. They also comply with the World Health Organization's um, their, uh, their uh, analysis of what it, what it means to impact holistic health. So when we talk about health, we're really talking about holistic health. We're talking about physical health, mental health, as well as social health. So from drawing from the detailed analysis of, those, uh, of this data and looking at the data of how buildings were performing against those health impact categories, we were able to correlate this data with the projects and project scores. Um, and this is kind of the first time that we've been able to do this because it's the first time that we've had enough data to have statistical significance. So what we found was that projects that are scoring in the three-star category, which is, of course, the minority of projects. It's only, I think, about 9% of projects that are scoring at a three-star level. Um, but what we're seeing is that they are impacting health in two key areas uh, where they're really impacting it at a greater level than other projects uh, that are scoring in the one-star area. And those two key categories are morbidity and absenteeism. So that's life expectancy, right? Morbidity. Um, and is associated directly with absenteeism as is supported by the evidence base. And the other key area that we're seeing three-star projects outperforming one-star projects is in feelings of well-being. Um, feelings of well-being addresses all aspects of mental health. Um, and so that's a really important kind of beginning of an insight and we can just keep developing these insights now that we have enough statistical significance in our data set. Um, and that's really exciting because for us 2021 is the year of data. Um, so we will continue to share those insights with you, and we obviously have a lot more data than we're showing today. So we anticipate that as Fitwell users continue to use Fitwell, um, they'll really be able to optimize their projects to address the health priorities, address the health priorities that matter the most to them and their occupants and their stakeholders, because we can really now have a more nuanced decision-making process and understand the, uh, the, the impact on those different health impact categories. So this is a really exciting development for Fitwell. Um, we always knew this was going to happen in 2021 because we knew kind of the trajectory of the data. Obviously, we didn't know that there was going to be a pandemic in 2020 that caused that incredible increase in demand. So our data set is even more robust than we were anticipating. Um, so just an example of kind of how this data-driven decision-making, how we're seeing this play out in the real world amongst you, our Fitwell users. Um, the recent announcement of our expanded partnership with Harrison Street provides an example of how data-driven decision-making will shape the industry. Um, this commitment represents Fitwell's largest commitment to date with Harrison Street 
um, implementing Fitwell within its portfolio of more than 500 properties that span student housing, and we already heard that they were an award winner in the student housing category, senior housing, medical office, and life science properties as well. Um, their use of Fitwell at this such great scale is going to enhance the data set so that it informs their strategy going forward to promote both health and business optimization. Fitwell's new scorecards also um, are adding a further opportunity to understand the relationship between design and health impacts. Um, and we have developed two new scorecards, even amongst the pandemic, the team has been working on these new scorecards because they're so critical to that building health for all uh, that we really believe in. The first one that was developed is the senior scorecard um, that was developed in partnership with Harrison Street and other industry leaders. It was released just last month. And I think everybody has seen obviously the devastating toll that COVID-19 has taken on the senior population. Um, we announced the senior scorecard last year, um, but the senior scorecard last year, we really needed to take a fresh look at that and understand how to ensure that we were really addressing uh, infectious respiratory disease, respiratory disease the respiratory disease, um, obviously in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. It was something that was already in the senior scorecard because of the seasonal flu, um, but we really wanted to ensure that the scorecard aligned with all of the new learnings uh, that we were gathering uh, throughout uh, 2020. So I'm delighted that that scorecard has now been released. Um, and I know that even though it was only released last month, we already have a project that's submitted for certification. So congratulations to folks on that. Um, the other scorecard that we are creating now as we speak is that we are beginning to pilot a garden style apartment scorecard. And this is very much responding to your demand that where you have these lower density properties with multiple buildings that may have the same footprint that we really needed to create a solution specific to that typology. We're also seeing a lot of investment into this typology on that broader scale as well. Um, so this has just started, um, and we're excited to share that new scorecard with you probably in Q3. So this attention to diverse housing typologies will help us learn more about housing environments uh, impacting population health. So the next phase that I'm going to look at is really looking at uh, demand. And what we're seeing on the demand side is a real shift. So when we first released Fitwell uh, for public use just four years ago, Project registrations and certifications were largely driven by building owners. Today, when we're looking at a breakdown of registered projects by scorecard, it's become clear that the demand is now being driven by tenants occupying those buildings. Um, so an example of this would be in the commercial interior scorecard, which now represents our largest used or our most used scorecard of all four categories. Um, and it's almost exclusively submitted by occupying tenants. Um, this registration grew massively over the last year, as I think Zach has already mentioned. So what's even more apparent from this next slide is really looking at how tenant registrations have now overtaken building owners. Um, so we, we started to see this shift, obviously, a couple of years ago, as you can see from the numbers, um, both, both building owners and tenants were kind of level pegging basically in the kind of mid 40%. Um, this started to shift last year in 20, sorry, two years ago in 2019. Um, but as you can see from the data, um, that the tenants are really driving demand in 2020 with this incredible upsurge um, in 2020 alone to that now there's 73% of uh, projects that are being submitted for registration are being submitted by tenants. Um, so what this really tells us is that to have a health promoting environment as an employer is essential for your employees and essential to retain and attract the talent you need to be successful as a company. Um, so obviously, the real estate industry is going to really be uh, responding to this and has already responded to this. Uh, so the tenant driven demand is something that we want to just highlight for all of you that it is growing and has it grown massively because I think of COVID, obviously. So 2020 also saw the release of a much awaited piece of research from MIT, um, which for the first time actually quantifies the return on investment of healthy building certifications. I thought that this would be the big news for 2020. Of course, that was before uh, 2020 was impacted by the global pandemic. Um, so this is the first time that uh, 
there has been research, this is independent research, we didn't participate in this, but MIT looked at the healthy building certifications, not just Fitwell, um, and really looked at what is there a financial benefit to, uh, to using these certifications. And what was found in this report, which I think we just shared or linked to it, so you guys can go and read the entire piece of research for yourselves. Um, but one, one number just to pull out here is that buildings that have a healthy building certification, and it doesn't matter which one, um, command a four to 7% rent premium uh, compared to their peer properties without a certification. So that's just a high level. There's a lot of other data in there around um, the speed of attracting tenants, keeping tenants, and so on. Um, so a really great piece of uh, research out of MIT, which we've just shared with you guys uh, for a longer look. And then lastly, um, moving quickly through the different stakeholder groups from tenants to investors, um, as Anna mentioned, and as we've kind of teased you with, um, we are going to be putting out um, that uh, piece of uh, that survey and the accompanying report next week, uh, looking at investor sentiment. Um, we were really proud to partner with BGO and the UN to survey global investors to understand how COVID-19 pandemic had impacted their prioritization of health and how this and how health was really shaping their ESG investment strategy and how health and wellness has really now been established as part of that S metric for ESG and whether that was something that investors were also seeing, you know, uh, as opposed to us seeing it from our side. Uh, so really interesting findings. And like we said, we will share a link for you to download that next week when it comes out publicly. Um, so just a couple of the numbers that you see up here. Um, these are some big, big numbers, um, which kind of give you an indication of where the sentiment is. 92% of the investors surveyed plan to enhance their health and wellness strategy over the next three years. So long past, you know, hopefully when populations will have met, uh, will have reached herd immunity through vaccination, um, the global investors really see health and wellness remaining a priority and are committed to enhancing their approach. And then the other data, the other number here that you see on your screen is that 95% report tenants driving demand as the number one driver of demand, um, followed actually by building owners and then other investors as the third. Uh, in the, that's the order that they identified. And that of course aligns with what we're seeing as far as the shift in user and shift in demand on the Fitwell certification side as well. Um, so these are just uh, like a little highlight of some of the data that we're seeing. Um, and it's really exciting to be able to share that with all of you um, as soon as it's public. And now, this is the last part of uh, today's presentation. So thank you all for joining us and staying with us through Act 3. Um, and Act 3 is where we turn it over to some of our winners. Um, so I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to announce our remaining awards of the year. And these are our all time achievement awards amongst Fitwell users. So I've given some background. I'll give you some background on each of these three very special awards. And then I'll invite the speakers representing these companies to join us in a panel where we can discuss um, all things health and wellness. Um, so first of all, our first award is our Fitwell Excellence Award. Um, this goes to Kilroy Realty Corporation, who for the third year in a row, holds the record of the most certified projects of all time. Um, Kilroy has achieved this distinction by certifying its assets at scale, but also it is proactively recertifying its projects. So for those of you newer to Fitwell, your Fitwell certification is good for three years, and then year four, you need to recertify. And Kilroy has not only been the most to certify, but they are also recertifying at scale as well. So really excited to talk to Sarah from Kilroy in a minute on the panel. Our next award is our Fitwell Promise Award, which goes to Wells Fargo, who boasts the most registrations of all time, reflecting its commitment to advancing health across its portfolio of assets. Wells Fargo is leading the financial finance industry in its effort to quantify the impact of design and policy on the well-being of employees and customers. And you may remember that they also won the 2020 award for the most uh, registrations of 2020. So congratulations to Wells Fargo, and I look forward to introducing you to Genevin on our panel in a second. 
And then the last all-time award is our Fitwell Impact Award. And this goes to Alexandria Real Estate Equities, Inc. for achieving the highest scoring project of all time with the Alexandria Launch Lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is the second year in a row that Alexandria has held this distinction, demonstrating their unrivaled commitment to optimizing projects to advance health. Um, just as a, an aside, Alexandria were also the very first to achieve the Fitwell viral certification, response certification as well. So congratulations to Alexandria. These companies are truly setting the bar for advancing health with Fitwell. And I'm now pleased to invite our amazing speakers for, from each of these companies to join us for our panel discussion. We have Eleni Reed is joining us from Alexandria, Genevin Kwan from Wells Fargo, and Sarah Neff from, from Kilroy. So welcome to all my panelists. Hello, everybody. Hello. Oh, hello. Um, so wonderful to have you all. And I'm sure everyone listening is probably delighted to hear directly from Fitwell users um, and not just me all the time. <laughs> so um, we have put folks' bios up on the chat function. Um, so I'm not going to I'm not going to go through folks' bios, but I would ask each of you, starting with Sarah and then Eleni and then Jedevin, to go through and introduce yourself briefly to our audience. Um, let them know about your company and also what drew you initially to Fitwell, because all of you uh, represent some longtime users of Fitwell. So starting with Sarah, thank you. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm Sarah Neff. I'm the Senior Vice President of Sustainability at Kilroy Realty. I also have to say, I am joined today by Vaishali Sampat and Jasmine Lomax on my team who did all of the heavy lifting for our Fitwell Awards. So thank you so much to my team members. It was a lot of work. Um, so Kilroy uh, is a real estate investment trust, publicly traded, active on West Coast markets, mostly office, although we do have some multifamily life science and retail. And basically what happened for us was that in 2015, 2014, we were seeing this major trend in building health coming. Um, I always often look to my uh, friends in Australia who had been focusing on this quite a bit at the time. And, uh, and yet it was so confusing how we were supposed to do health. Um, you know, there wasn't lead of health at the time. And, you know, was it, we were supposed to test all the air? Was it something about Legionella? Was it water? Were we supposed to just give everybody water fountains? Was it views? Was it, uh, you know, sit stand desks? It was very confusing. And, um, and there was just a lot to navigate. And so when Fitwell came out and it was so approachable and not easy, but easy to understand. Um, and was backed by a fantastic mountain of research. Um, and with, um, you know, with, in partnership with the CDC and GSA, we thought, yes, we have found the product that's gonna work for us. Um, it, uh, we were really excited to be one of the first users of Fitwell and part of the Fitwell pilot. Um, and it taught us a lot. And the thing that's been great for us is that Fitwell has really changed how our buildings um, are operating. So, you know, we, so new buildings coming on or new asset management teams say, wait, well, I want to be fit well. Why did the others buildings get it? And I didn't when a building is doing a repositioning. Those teams know to reach out and say, what do we need to do to get to fit well? And so we've really seen it change how our whole asset management team is approaching their buildings. And also, you know, when the, when the pandemic hit, we were so i um, grateful that we'd had this partnership for a long time because, for example, we'd started opening up our stairwells years ago because Fitwell had told us that there was this great research connecting active stairwells to human health. And all of a sudden, that was a strategy we needed to reduce congestion at the elevator. So it really positioned us really well um, when 2020 hit. It's really streamlined what health means for us. And it's really helped our asset managers find an approachable way to understand how they can make their buildings healthier. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, Eleni, would you like to talk about your journey? I just want to give Eleni a, a shout out because um, she was actually part of the GSA team that originally created Fitwell, so can probably tell me more about Fitwell than I can tell you. But anyway, um, please let us know about the journey that Alexandria has been along and, uh, and about yourself as well. Thank you. Absolutely. And uh, this is a marvelous event and it's been fantastic to follow the progress of the Fitwell rating system since 2017. We've been following it closely in my different roles. 
Um, so I currently head sustainability at Alexandria Realties. Um, I joined a few months ago, so the credit is really to, uh, to the team and to the company, and I'm representing the company today. Our, our journey is, is really one that's mission driven. So we're an office REIT that focuses and specializes in life sciences, technology, and ag tech campuses. So it's really at the heart of our mission. Um, we're in really at the vanguard of the life sciences sector. <clears throat> Just by way of example, we have approximately 80 tenants in our buildings that are pursuing COVID related research and many more that are driving solutions to advance um, human health and nutrition. Um, and so all of this is mission driven for us. Um, we place a premium on health and well-being for our employees as well as our tenants. And uh, it's really been the way we've thought about design um, and operations. So we've incorporated a number of features, um, you know, in terms of fitness centers, healthy foods, access to daylight and views. And we also always had a robust indoor air quality policy because of the environment that we're in. And so when the FitWell rating system uh, came out on the market, we were really interested and are primarily using it to really propel our efforts to the next level. Um, it's a great tool to, to benchmark where we are and to advance, um, you know, healthy, the healthy buildings in, in our sector. So uh, we started our journey there. And uh, obviously, when we were very involved, <clears throat> when it came time to explore the FitWell viral module, and we can talk about that in, the, in a little while, but that's been our journey. Great. Thank you so much. Genevin, a, a different perspective because you guys have a lot of properties that your tenants in, um, as well as a massive workforce. Workforce. Can you just let us know how big your employee base is? You you gave me an analysis of it compared to the size of a city, which I was shocked by. So, uh, gentlemen, if you can give us an intro, I would appreciate it. Oh, Genevin. Timothy Frozen. Maybe she's frozen. Okay, when we get her back, I will have her introduce um, Wells Fargo and all the work that they've been doing um, amongst their portfolio. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move on to the first question and maybe the team can see if we can get a new link to Janavin working. Um, I am here. <laughs> oh, you're there. Wonderful. Yes, it did seem like it froze for a bit there. So hello, just wanted to uh, keep you guys all waiting. <laughs> thank you so much. So. Jennifer, we'd, we'd love to hear more about what you're doing with Wells Fargo um, and then the journey that you've been on and, and very much the kind of your employee base um, and just how large it is. I was shocked to hear just how many people work at Wells Fargo. Great. Well, thank you, Joanna. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. Um, and really, thank you for having this opportunity to talk to you all. Um, I represent Wells Fargo, and I'm on the sustainability strategy team within corporate properties. As uh, Joanna, was uh, Joanna was mentioning, uh, Wells Fargo has a very large employee base. We have approximately the same population as the city of Orlando, just to give you guys an, um, an idea of the number of employees that we're serving. And that is not including the millions of customers that come through our doors every day. And so um, one of the things that I do in my job, which I love, is to really be thinking a little bit more long-term uh, originally, I started out thinking more along the lines of environmental sustainability, but what I found to be really helpful with FitWell is to be able to expand our thinking uh, with a common language that we can share across our teams, with a common language that is very approachable, that our employees at some point will also be able to understand, and hopefully also be able to share these ideas and concepts with our customers at some point as well. So we're still very early in the journey. Uh, but also what's very helpful for us in using FitWell is that it enables us to branch out beyond environmental sustainability into really the broader themes of environmental, social, and governance. And a lot of the elements within FitWell allow us, once again, to have that common language to be able to communicate those ideas and our direction and our goals to not only our partners, externally, but also to our partners internally. So I see folks on the, the call there with our HR department, as an example, with our sourcing department, and of course, with uh, the folks on our team specifically who did all of the hard work uh, in helping us get the registrations done. So thank you to them as well. So that's what really drove us is because we do have a large um, and very diverse audience. And we also have a very large and very diverse real estate footprint. Uh, it is predominantly domestic, but we do also have international sites. 
And Fitwell, once again, is one of those things where because it is very flexible and very approachable, we feel that it is a unifier that we can use across our global footprint. So, uh, yeah, that's one of the reasons why it brought us uh, to Fitwell. Uh, we do have such a large stock of existing buildings, and we really wanted something that would help us raise the boat for all properties and not just for our top performers. And going back to the idea that Sarah was talking about, about everybody sort of like, why me? Why don't I get Fitwell certified? Or why don't I have this certification? Uh, equity across all of our sites is also very important. And so we really want to use this tool to highlight what we actually already have. Uh, it gives us a different perspective, helps us be a little more positive in the way that we look at uh, what we already are providing and also provide context for all of our different audiences and, uh, and a similar frame of reference. That's great. No, thank you. Yeah, I think that, you know, being able to have that kind of baseline across a diverse portfolio is certainly one of the things that we set out to do with Fitwell. And actually, because it was created for the General Service Administration at the beginning, Eleni, um, they have a massive and diverse portfolio. Um, so it was always meant to work across existing assets, new assets, all assets, cl asset classes. So it's fabulous to hear um, that that is you know, how you're using it and you see it as a, as a way to uni have uniform data. Um, so I would now like to have like a discussion a little bit about the data as 2021 is the year of data. Um, and I would love to hear from each of you kind of how you're using that data, how the science base really helps you to talk about what you're doing you know, how it gives you that extra kind of um, information you need when communicating with tenants or investors um, or whomever it is that is the decision, kind of driving the decision making. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, Sarah again. We go through round <laughs> again. Um, so yeah, yeah. great to hear from you about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll start on the investor side. So we started in 2020 incorporating uh, the percentage of our portfolio uh, certified under Fitwell in every press release that Kilroy puts out and in all of our publications, you know, SEC filings and whatnot. And it's because investors have been asking for data about health. And it's hard to distill, you know, okay, you know, this percentage here, am I talking about parts per million of CO2 on average? You know, uh, and so we really found that we needed a health metric that was easy to communicate to the investment community. Um, and so this was the metric we chose, was the percentage of our portfolio certified under Fitwell, which is just under 40%. It was above 40% we sold a building. So we've given Fitwell buildings to the world. Um, we've, we've had um, increasing investor questions about health. I think the investment community is trying to figure out how to quantify health, they're just kind of getting going. We're even quantifying the E in ESG, let alone the S in ESG as it relates to health. They're getting pretty good on employee diversity and whatnot. Um, and so this, this is the data point that we're able to provide um, to, to really show that our investors that we're very proactive um, on the subject. And so far it's been very well received. Fantastic, thank you. Eleni, from the perspective of Alexandria, obviously you have a highly sophisticated tenant base who have more PhDs, I wouldn't say more than the CDC, but a lot of PhDs in your tenant base, I would imagine. Um, so very much a science focused tenant base. So how are you finding that you are able to communicate with your tenants in a way that is meeting them kind of where they're at and their needs uh, as far as data or science? Um, if you can kind of talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think from our perspective, it, it's really about having those benchmarks and being able to explain not only that, you know, we have a certification, but what that all means in terms of their ability to continue to operate in an environment that's healthy and safe. And so that's really the way that, that we've approached it. And I think, um, you know, the, the rating system is, is fantastic. Uh, I think it builds upon practices that we already had in place. And so I think tenants who um, are within Alexandria buildings know that they can expect a, a very high quality environment with superior indoor environmental quality and just all these things that, that are necessary to operate in the lab environment. So all these topics are of interest and, and being able to communicate um, Alexandria's efforts in this space has, has been great. I think another interesting thing we're doing is that that we also have a number of, uh, and the, the, the office that won the award um, is one of our launch labs. And effectively, these are spaces that Alexandria operates for startup companies. And it's a good opportunity for, uh, for a tenant to be in a space that has a certification and to kind of experience that well, uh, real time. 
and um, I think similar to Kilroy, uh, it's it's a you know the the number of certs is a really good metric too in terms of communication. Um, we certainly had you know more broader questions around uh, what we're doing to promote health and well-being uh, from investors, but certainly the topic is gaining increased uh, increased focus as as has been talked about earlier. Great, fantastic. And then Genevin, you you touched on the equity issue, and it's one that I'd like to go back to um, because it's obviously very important to you at Wells Fargo, it's very important to us at Center for Active Design. Um, and I think uh, Dr. Bonku also mentioned equity as well, right? So I think that I know that COVID has really shown us that we have major disparities in our health um, across, certainly across the US. Um, folks were just surprised to find of the health disparities in New York City. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why they were surprised, but they are, they are really, um, you know, immense the disparities that we see across populations. So it was great to hear kind of your uh, take and really kind of your prioritization of equity across your workforce. Um, so can you kind of talk a little bit more about that equity and how, you know, having a benchmark approach, having a single standard can really kind of add to that understanding of equity? Sure. I, I think, you know, when we talk about equity, um, there's lots of different types of equity. And uh, I think what we're talking about specifically has to be within our little microcosm for the moment, right? Um, when we talk about the amenities that we are providing in our in the workplace that we uh, sort of that workplace experience. And uh, so when we talk about equity, a lot of times there's a lot of things that I'm sure any of you that's worked for a large organization knows we'd really love to do. And for a smaller organization, or even for like my own family, as an example, or like within a group of friends, it's very easy to, to implement. But in a larger organization, there has to be structure. And equity really comes with, um, if you focus too much just on one group, uh, it makes all everybody else feel like they're not being taken care of, right? And, and yet in a large organization, everybody is important that we all play very different roles. Uh, and in fact, the larger you are, sort of the more segmented your work becomes, right? And so the workplace is one of the areas where particularly working with teams such as HR or sourcing, um, where at an enterprise level across the board, we can really think about the things which are going to be common, that it's the same experience that you're going to have at one location as you will have in another. And there will, of course, be vari variables. Uh, and it will be different. We have buildings that are 100 years old and we have buildings that are one month old, right? And so there really is just um, a reality to the, the type of uh, physical things that we can provide and there'll be a little bit of variation. But the ability to, for us to be saying, these are the things in general that really matter to us at Wells Fargo and to the best of our ability, this is our compass north. This is, this is where we want to head. We might not be able to get there right now. Uh, every place is going to be slightly different, but the goal is the same. So I think a lot of it is that data is not so much saying uh, counting certifications in in our in our um, in our particular situation, because honestly, a lot of our our sites probably would not get fit well certification, right? Just because of the disparities in age and and different types of things like that. But where we can start to talk is to break it down and say, here are the elements within this framework of FitWell that really matter to your mental health. And this is how we provide it at Wells Fargo. So it may not look exactly same, same across every single location, but here's what HR does. This is part of the policy that speaks to this. This is what uh, corporate properties does. And this is how it speaks to, to that part of your mental health as an employee. Uh, in, in our organization. So that's how we tend to, or we would like to use the data. Like I said, we're very preliminary, very early stages. We, we're loading the data, but we want to be able to break it out, I think, more into those pillars rather than look at it from like a, a general certification perspective because our core business is not real estate, right? So our investors or the people coming into our branches or the people that are working for us their first and foremost isn't really whether or not our workplace is certified. What they care about is that the air is clean, that they have, you know, options for food, uh, you know, maybe that we provide good medical benefits and, you know, like that whole employee experience. And so we need to go to that level to talk to the different audiences and 
the data really just helps us break it down into chunks that are fairly consistent across the board. And then we'll, we'll kind of pick and choose how we use it depending on the audience that we're talking about. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, and then the kind of the last question that I'd love each of you to just kind of think about um, and give folks insight in as much as, as you choose to, of course, understanding that we're in a competitive industry, um, but plans for the future. Um, so I know, Genevin, you had uh, discussed kind of the sustainability. Um, I'd love if you can share kind of like, what are your plans for the future? We just, you know, I gave you a little insight about the investor sentiment uh, survey that we've just done. I mean, we see kind of overall kind of uh, where the industry is going in the future, but I would love each of you to kind of speak um, about you know, where you see the future going uh, for each of you around health. So gentlemen, if you'd like to start, we'll go in, we'll go in the office order this time. Sure. So as I mentioned, you know, real estate for us isn't a core business, but I do think that what we do is extremely relevant to the future in a number of different ways. Um, one is just internally as Wells Fargo, we just released a goal to become net positive by 2050, and that includes all finance emissions, right? And so in order to do that, I think you have to walk the walk because part of what gives us credibility as an organization is the ability to go in front of our own clients, right? Our core business is providing money and services and products um, to help the financial health of our clients. And so as they become more interested and as we want to reduce the carbon footprint in our finance emissions, we need to be able to show that there are a lot of things that are very tangible, easy to do, easy to understand for an organization. Well, they're not easy to do, but they're doable, uh, you know, that an organization can do that can have a real tangible impact. And so uh, we can take this experience and for the future, I see that actually organize, uh, groups like ourselves, like corporate properties are going to start working more closely together with other internal lines of business because suddenly we are united by a common goal, right? For 2050 and then externally we have uh, much greater credibility when we are able to walk the walk to show that we've gone through the challenges, we've had some successes, uh, we've had, you know, other areas where we've really, you know, floundered and haven't been able to figure it out or we have figured out a solution. And those are the things that our lines of business are now coming to us and asking us within corporate properties to say, hey, can you, you know, join us and have a quick chat with one of our clients because they're interested in, health and well-being in the workplace, or they're interested in how they can cut their greenhouse gas emissions, of which, you know, the, the building footprint is a huge part of, uh, of their emissions, or even things like renewable energy, which we work on, right? Um, all of those things, I think for the future, being able to use a tool like FitWell to say, we are focused on continuous improvement and on providing the best place possible, the best organization possible for all of our different audiences and fit well this happens to be one of these tools that we think works really well is going to help us to have a greater impact as well as have greater credibility within our own client base wonderful great thank you um eleni uh if you'd like to give us your crystal ball uh as to future plans um and future direction for health and wellness <laughs> Yeah, so for Alexandria, it's really about uh, continuing to be at the leading edge of healthy building practices and, uh, you know, safe environments to work in. And so we're advancing our efforts and there, there are kind of two tracks that we're pursuing. Uh, one is that um, from a certification standpoint, we've partnered with the Center for Active Design to develop a, a life sciences specific scorecard that is very much tailored to Alexandria um, buildings and lab spaces. So we're really excited uh, for the opportunity to really take our efforts to the next level in that regard with this specific uh, focus. Um, the, the other thing we're doing is because this, this issue of health and safety is so critical to, to our business, we have an internal initiative that we've created called ARE Safe, which is really about building on our longstanding practices for operational excellence and taking it to the next level. Um, and we're, we're wanting to provide through this initiative even healthier, safer, and more sustainable uh, spaces for our tenants. Um, and some of the, the key tenants of ARE Safe 
really talk about the leveraging of smart building technology, improved systems, and really the foundational base for all of that is our operational excellence practices. So those are kind of the two areas of focus for us as we think about, you know, how to propel our efforts in the next year. Great, fantastic. And finally, to Sarah, who's been in this uh, meeting for a long time. I'd love to. <laughs> yes, um, and I'll, I'll follow Lenny with sort of two main sort of things we'll be working on. One is flexibility, right? So um, one of the great things about the FitWell scorecard is I think it really helps us think about what is a flexible workspace, right? A flexible workspace is when there's, you can work outside or inside. You can, you know, have a, enjoy this amenity on the ground floor and this thing on the roof. You know, where where can you work? Do you have, do you have options? Do you have break groups? Do you have this, that, the other? I think that is telling the story of the flexibility of our spaces is gonna be really, really important as folks come back when we don't know um, how every tenant is going to approach this differently. I can tell you every tenant is going to approach it differently. I don't know how they're going to do it, but every tenant is going to want to do it in their own way. And we need to demonstrate that we have the workspaces that can handle whatever their needs happen to be, which percentage are working from home or not, or some are here, some are there. You can only have meetings outside. You can meet, you know, with masks here or the other. Um, and so I think fellow is really going to help us tell that story of flexibility. And then on the flip side, as we build up more spaces, we're going to, those spaces will sort of naturally um, be more uh, amenable to the FitWell scorecards. We also look forward to increasing um, our FitWell certified square footage. Um, the other side is our supply chain. Um, Kilroy has been uh, forward thinking on realizing that a lot of our health and our environmental impacts and our social impacts in general are not within our own employee base, but are along our supply chain. So we started surveying our operational tier one, critical tier one suppliers back in 2019. We extended that to the development suppliers in 2020, and this year will be the transactional suppliers. So lawyers and auditors and um, accountants, that kind of thing. But the point, brokers, um, but the point is we want those suppliers to realize the benefit of focusing on health. And so whenever we do one of these surveys, we are, we're asking sort of, where are you at? What's going on? But then we're providing recommendations for improvement. And if we don't see a health program for your employee base, we would assume that then your employee base is not their most productive and are not gonna be providing us the best service. So it's totally in our best interest to have a great performing supply chain and great performing uh, tier one vendors. And so the goal is to uh, give this knowledge to, um, to our supply chain as well and help lift them up um, to the level where we think we're at and where we hope to be going. That's wonderful. Well, great. So thank you all so much. This actually brings us to the end of the panel, but I really appreciate everybody um, adding their kind of wisdom and all of their kind of uh, practice in actually doing this. Like we at Fitwell don't run a portfolio. We are not managing assets. You know, we're just in the middle here translating between researchers and, um, and all of you. So we really do appreciate all of you for sharing um, your experience um, in really kind of elevating health and wellness throughout. So thank you so much. Uh, congratulations again for being our all-time winners in 2021. Um, and we really look forward to continuing to celebrate everyone's success. Because it's been virtual this year and not a big party, um, we are going to continue to actually elevate and talk about uh, all of the successes of all of the winners throughout the rest of the year in social media, in all sorts of different events. So stay tuned um, and you're going to hear a lot more from us and from our winners uh, as the year progresses. Um, so thank you all for joining on the panel today. Um, and I will now wrap it up because I have three minutes and my team will be so proud of me for staying on time, which is very unusual for me. Um, so I would say just in kind of in wrapping up here that Fitwell is all about building health for all. Um, equity has always been at the heart of our practice as a nonprofit organization. Yes, we want to bring about market transformation, but we want to bring about the entire market transformation for all asset classes and impacting all of our communities. Um, so that's a really important uh, aspect of all of the work that we're doing. You're hearing this again from, you know, all of our users also obviously share that aspiration as well. I think this year with the pandemic, we've really seen the disparities in health um, that are across all of our populations, uh, not just here in the US, but globally, we're seeing these health disparities. We're also understanding that although the pandemic has really sp put a spotlight on infectious disease, that what we're seeing is people who are impacted the most by the infectious disease are ones who also often have a comorbidity, um, which is you know, maybe diabetes or obesity, um, there's also all sorts of other chronic diseases uh, that are coming to the fore, like mental health, depression. Um, dis depression actually accounts for the number one um, 
the cause of uh, disability globally. Um, and we have, yes, we've had a crisis around infectious disease, but we also have a mental health crisis across the world. And we're gonna really be focusing on that in 2021 and beyond, just like we always have, but really putting the spotlight on how our built environment uh, impacts mental health and how we can do this in an equitable way. Um, so lastly, I'd like to thank the entire Fitwell team, um, the entire CFAD team who's put on today's event. Thank you so much. Um, we are not, you know, technical wizards, and I think that everyone has done an amazing job of doing that. So thank you so much. Thank you to all of the Fitwell team, and thank you to all of you. And Rena has joined me again. Yeah, no, thanks for everyone for joining us, and I'm, I'm hoping our, our team will join on as well. But if not, thank you to everyone in the audience. and. Um, there we go. Yes, Suzanne. Suzanne was the other uh, person orchestrating today with the rest of the team. Um, so congratulations to all of you um, for all the work you do. Um, it's an amazing team and I'm really proud to be part of the, the CFAD team. So we're looking forward to a really exciting 2021. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we look forward to working with you, continuing to work with you. Oh, yay. We have more of our team. Thank you, everybody. Um, we have Jessica and Sarah who've been answering your questions. Actually, Whitney who's been asking questions, Jessica who's been manning the day. So thank you everybody. There's a few of the CFAD team and we look forward to seeing you all hopefully very soon. Thank you. <laughs>